Hi, my name is Mitch, and today we're going to be moving on to our 30th presidential biography. And that, of course, means we're going to be focusing on our 30th president, Calvin Coolidge. So Coolidge was born as John Calvin Coolidge Jr. in Plymouth Notch, Vermont, on July 4th, 1872. He is the only president to have been born on Independence Day. So we have had three presidential deaths, actually, on Independence Day. Uh, his parents were, of course, named John Sr. and Victoria. His name is obviously an ode to the famous minister from France, John Calvin, who inspired the Calvinist church and uh, kind of pushed the idea of predestination. Now, the Coolidge's were, or uh, rather John Sr. was a storekeeper and farmer. And so naturally the young Calvin, as he came to be referred to his middle name more so uh, in order to distinguish him from his father. Calvin grew up aiding his father, John Sr., with many of his duties and chores, as well as attending a local elementary school in Plymouth. Now, unfortunately, uh, Calvin's mother died at the when he was 12, and his sister died at 18, and naturally these two deaths weighed heavily on him as a young child. Still, he persevered and enrolled at Amherst College in Massachusetts in 1891, and he graduated four years after that. Now, after graduating, Coolidge moved to the town of Northampton in Massachusetts, where he began to read law at a local law firm. And at the time, reading law really just meant that you were kind of like an apprentice. You were kind of like an intern, per se, at a law firm. Uh, and this was a stepping stone to becoming a lawyer. And so in 1897, he naturally is admitted to the bar and opens his own practice in Northampton, which quickly becomes very successful. Now, because of his reputation as a successful lawyer, he becomes very popular in local Republican politics and the local Republican Party. And thus he's elected to the Northampton City Council in 1898, which is his first elected office. He's elected the city solicitor in 1900 and the county clerk in 1903. And these three victories lead him, though, unfortunately, into his only loss at the ballot box which was when he ran for the Northampton School Board in 1905. And many people say, well, most of the time, even Coolidge himself really said that he only lost that election because he, in fact, did not have any children who would be served by the Northampton School Board. And so many people say because of that, uh, they fear he didn't really have a vested interest in the school board. And so he, that's the only election he ever lost in, in his entire life. However, he keeps going and, and uh, he's elected to the House of Representatives in 1906. And then the mayor of Northampton, or sorry, the Massachusetts House of Representatives, rather, in 1906. And then he's elected to the mayor, to be the mayor of Northampton in 1909. Now, while he's a uh, rising politician, he meets a one, Grace Anna Goodhue. Uh, who is a teacher at a school for the deaf in Northampton in 1904. Now, two of them are married in 1905, the following year, and have two children together. Their names were John Calvin, um, who uh, lived all the, or who became, who lived all the way to, you know, almost into the 21st century and became a businessman, and Calvin Jr., who we will talk about a little bit more during Coolidge's actual administration, because Calvin Jr., unfortunately dies when he's only 15, and this weighs heavily on the president. Now, going back to Coolidge's rise in politics, he served a number of local offices, uh, as I previously mentioned, and in the state house. This, so this leads him nicely into a bid for the Massachusetts Senate in 1911, which he does win. He remains in the Senate until 1915, uh, in the last year um, of, the, of his time in the Senate, in the Massachusetts Senate, he serves as the president. Now, he then also becomes the lieutenant governor, or rather, he becomes the lieutenant governor in 1916 and serves there for three years. Uh, and this is up until he wins the governorship uh, the following year. Now, as the governor of Massachusetts, Coolidge faced a crisis, his biggest crisis probably as governor, when 
there was a police strike in the in Boston, which is the capital and largest city of Massachusetts, has long been. And so the crisis was that the this was ta- this took place during the progressive era, and naturally strikes were rising up across the country in order to obtain better rights for workers. And so this happened with the police in Boston. And so Coolidge, it, it, got, it got so bad that Coolidge as governor felt the need to call in the Massachusetts National Guard to break up the strike. And this was extremely controversial and even earned scorn from Samuel Gompers, who was one of the most important, most prominent labor leaders in the country at the time. He was the president and founder of the American Federation of Labor, the AFL, which was probably the greatest workers' rights organization in the country. And so <laughs> Sam actually earning scorn from someone like Samuel Gompers was not a very popular, was not a very, very good thing for Coolidge at the time as the governor. And so Coolidge defended his actions by saying that the strikers had no right uh, as they threatened the public safety. So Coolidge said that that while he while he was in many ways a progressive and in many ways agreed with many progressive policies, that the strikers threatened the safety of the city, of the city of Boston and that they had no right to strike, as by striking, they, je- they put in jeopardy the safety of the citizens of Boston, Massachusetts. Now, despite this altercation with Gompers, Coolidge did, again, push for a progressive agenda as governor, uh, even supporting wage increases and limits to child and woman labor. Now, again, tri- p- limiting child labor does not really seem uh, like that big a deal now, but in in that time, uh, in the early 20th century, it was a massive controversial issue uh, and, and really seen as, as one of the defining uh, pieces of the progressive agenda. Now, Coolidge quickly builds a reputation uh, as a progressive governor, and this uh, and his, his, his work with the Boston police strike though controversial, thus catapults him to national fame. So he becomes pretty well known nationwide after the Boston police strike. So he, and because of his, his progressive positions as governor, he becomes a really popular national figure. And this, this catapults him into the, uh, the vice presidential nomination in 1920, uh, running alongside the Ohio Senator Warren Harding. Now that year, uh, Wilson is the, the, is the president. Woodrow Wilson's the president. He presided over the uh, the what, U.S. entry into World War One, uh, and, and the economic crisis that happened after that that occurred after that. And so naturally, Wilson leaves office as one of the most unpopular presidents of all time. And Harding campaigns on this idea of a return to normalcy in which the United States would return to the way it was before World War I, that the United States should not be sticking its fingers into Europe as it was or, or being uh, the, the, trying to become the great national power it was. Harding campaigned on strict isolationism and many conservative policies. And so um, the country was really there at the point, uh, at, at, that, at that point in 1920, in the midst of a uh, – recession, a great recession, uh, uh, and after the, the most devastating conflict the world had ever seen, they were ready for a change. And so the Republican ticket wins Harding and Coolidge uh, over Cox and Roosevelt, uh, Ro- that being Franklin Roosevelt, who would later become the president, which we'll talk about later, obviously. And so uh, Coolidge becomes the 29th vice president of the United States on March 4th, 1921. Now, as was custom at the time, Coolidge played a very small role in the Harding administration. So at the time, the, the, the vice presidency was less seen as a piece of the executive branch as it was with the legislative branch, as the vice president still today is the president of the Senate. And so back then, that role was far more important to the office, whereas today we would largely see that, that role as largely ceremonial and not as important uh, as the vice president's role in the presidential administration. And so this actually benefited Coolidge as he was able to keep himself out of much of the corruption of the Harding administration as he had very little to do with it. Um, Now tragedy strikes the Harding administration 
when President Harding dies unexpectedly in San Francisco, California, in uh, on August 2nd, 1923, of a heart attack. Now, Coolidge is um, Coolidge is vacationing at his family hometown in Plymouth, uh, Vermont, and he learns of the uh, of the uh, the death of the president in the middle of the night. So, a messenger from the town goes to the Coolidge residence where there's no, they don't have any telephones, they don't have any electricity because of their old fashioned family roots. Um, and so the following morning, Coolidge is awoken by his father and is told of the news that the president has died. He gets dressed, he says a prayer, um, and he greets the reporters, the many reporters who had actually gathered downstairs at his house in order to see the swearing in of the new president. Now, again, the Coolidge's, at least John Sr., was not, uh, did not like the idea of electricity, which seems very antiquated, of course, but they had no electricity in the house. It was the middle of the night, uh, early morning hours of August 3rd. And so by kerosene lamp, by the light of a kerosene lamp, Coolidge is sworn in as the 30th president of the United States by his father, who was a notary public. Coolidge, now the president of the United States, then goes back to sleep, uh, which is one of the, my favorite presidential anecdotes that when, when he's sworn in as president in the middle of the night, you know, he doesn't just start, you know, planning what he's going to do, how he's going to handle this, his return to Washington. No, he just goes back to sleep, which is, which is one of the most uh, fantastic stories of, uh, in presidential history, in my opinion. Now, Coolidge takes office when at a time of great crisis. So Harding, Harding starts off as one of the most popular presidents ever. I mean, of course, he wins by a landslide. His policies are extremely popular. Uh, he starts reducing the economic crisis, well, the whether that was really Harding's doing, you could argue. But nonetheless, he's extremely popular. But the scandals, the corruption of the Harding administration begin to take hold in 1922, 1923. And this happened exactly when Coolidge becomes president. So shortly after he takes office, the Teapot Dome scandal breaks, which if you watch the Harding video, of course, I explain the Teapot Dome scandal at length. And so the Teapot Dome scandal was a situation in which the Secretary of the Interior, Harding Secretary of the Interior, Albert Fall, uh, sold land, uh, oil fields, at the Teapot Dome oil fields to Mammoth Oil, uh, a large corporation in Wyoming for $300,000, which was paid directly to fall, and that the government had nothing to do with. And so when this scandal, scandal breaks, it's a huge deal because that's, that's like one of the most blaringly obvious examples of corruption. And so other things start to break, you know, these late night poker games in which Harding traded away things like White House China, um, things like that, and, and just, uh, you know, all of these different uh, scandals start breaking when Coolidge becomes president. However, Coolidge is quickly able to demonstrate that he was separated from much of the scandal of the Harding administration. And th this is through his quiet and calm demeanor and his efforts to root out corruption quickly. And so by the end of the year, people are celebrating him as, as, a, as, a, as a savior of the office of the presidency, someone who could restore the public faith. And this is really solidified in his December of 1923 address in which, you know, he lays out his plan as president, you know, because people had not really known what to think of him when he becomes president. It was so unexpected. Uh, and um, yeah, and no one really knew what to think of him. So in December 1923, he lays out everything. And this solidifies the, the restoration of dignity, really, as, as it becomes known in the in the presidency. Now, for the most part, he actually does just stress the continuation of many of Harding's policies. And these include isolationism, they include tax cuts, and they include immigration restriction, all of which he ends up implementing. Now, Harding, or Coolidge rather, becomes president in the wake of World War I. So World War I is done for about five years when Coolidge becomes president. And naturally, there's a lot of issues with how, the, how World War I was resolved. 
So Wilson was part of, if you watched the Wilson video, we discussed how Wilson was part of this committee uh, of, of the, the allied leaders who draft the Treaty of Versailles, which forces Germany, among many other things, to pay large reparations e uh, for their part in World War I. Now, this caused a massive crisis in Germany. Germany was not equipped, having lost the war, Germany was, was not equipped to pay these reparations on the schedule that the, the Treaty of Versailles laid out. And so this became very clear and caused massive crisis and, and uh, inflation in the country of Germany. Um, and so the, uh, the Dawes plan comes about uh, in the early 20s uh, as a solution to the, uh, or as an attempted solution to, the, the, uh, to the, the fact that Germany could not pay these reparations. And so the Dawes plan, which is named after and written by uh, Charles Dawes, who would soon become the vice president of the United States, uh, creates a new schedule for, the, uh, for Germany to pay reparations based on what they actually could pay in reality, not the idealistic you know, view of the allied powers. And so, you know, though obviously this doesn't work out in the end as World War II breaks out in 1939, largely because of the Treaty of Versailles, uh, it's hailed as a uh, massive breakthrough as, as many of the leading Allied powers signed the plan. And Dawes ends up winning the Nobel Peace Prize uh, the, in 1925 for his efforts in uh, aiding Germany in their crisis, in, the, in paying back the reparations on a schedule that they could. So this leads us to the election of 1924. So. You, you might have wondered why I brought up the Dawes plan at all, and oh, I only did because, yes, it was signed by the soon-to-be vice president of the United States, Charles Gates Dawes, and also, uh, or it was created by him, rather, and signed by President Coolidge himself. So th th these, these couple things, you know, his, his December 1923 address and the Dawes plan really catapults him into this popularity again, uh, despite the corruption of the, his predecessor. Uh, and so Coolidge becomes the leading candidate in 1924. Uh, going with the catchy slogan, you know, keep cool with Coolidge. Uh, on the other hand, we see John William Davis as the Democratic nominee. He's actually a very little known politician who was only called in to break up a uh, uh, deadlock in the convention. And so he's, he's a compromise candidate. He's not, he's not anybody's first choice, which naturally doesn't bode well for him. His, his running mate, though, is Charles Waylon Bryan, who is actually the brother of the three-time presidential candidate, William Jennings Bryan. We also have a third, uh, third party candidate here, and that is Robert La Follette, who is back running, taking back the Progressive Party, which was the party of Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, and he is from Wisconsin and uh, launches this third party candidate. Uh, uh, this third party run in order to, you know, try and keep the progressive attitude, progressive uh, agenda going in the in uh, Coolidge, who promised really to be one of the more conservative presidents. La Follette wins his home state of Wisconsin, uh, so he wins 13 electoral votes, but he does run a respectable third party campaign. Coolidge, however, wins by a landslide in both the pop electoral and popular votes and is elected in his own right, only the second vice president to become president at the death of their predecessor to win election in their own right. Now Coolidge presided over a period of rapid economic growth and this was known as the Roaring Twenties. So probably because of part, partially because of Harding's policies, uh, the United States began transitioning from the disastrous post-war uh, economic state to one of extreme prosperity. It's one of the, the greatest eras of prosperity in the, in the economy that we have seen in, in, in American history. And this, this was bolstered by legislation pushed also by Coolidge that lowered uh, income tax rates, which were raised, you know, which were created actually during the Wilson administration. And they also eliminated other Wilson era taxes. Now, as was Coolidge's goal, these tax cuts allow people to further invest in businesses, 
And this naturally sees a massive increase in speculation, meaning that people would invest quite a bit uh, more so in order to get even larger returns than they had previously. Now, this was uh, this was a popular practice at the time. It did get people money in the in the short run, but in the long run, uh, this these laissez-faire policies and this speculation many people see as playing a dominant factor in the crash of 1929, which we will discuss more during the Hoover video. But Coolidge does take a very hands-off approach, very laissez-faire, in order to uh, in order to bolster this period of economic uh, growth. Now, Coolidge was also an ardent supporter of civil rights, as was his predecessor, uh, Warren Harding. So throughout his administration, he often spoke out against prejudice, uh, in addition to hate crimes, and even called on Congress many times to make lynching a federal crime. Now, he's unsuccessful in these regards for the most part, as uh, he takes office during the Red Scare, during the uh, emergence of the second Ku Klux Klan. And so while Coolidge himself was not, uh, was, was against, was for civil rights but, and against these uh, hate crimes and things like that, he's very unsuccessful in that regard. However, he does sign the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924, and this grants United States citizens, citizenship to all Native Americans living on reservations, as previously, uh, only Native Americans who weren't members of, or who weren't citizens of reservations uh, could be citizens of the United States. So now this made it that all Native Americans, whether they live on their own reservations or not, were uh, citizens of the United States. And this is the picture of Coolidge here, with, uh, with a very striking picture of Coolidge with a number of Native American leaders uh, during his presidency. Now, in line with his hands-off economic policy, Coolidge twice vetoes the McNary Hog and Farm Relief Bill. Now, this would have seen the government buy a surplus of crops from farmers at a fixed rate and then sell them to foreign buyers. And so this bill, uh, signed by here, McNary and Hogan, Senator McNary and Hogan on the right here, this bill was meant to ease the burden of American farmers. You know, there's the, the, the old Jeffersonian idea that America should be one, one based on agrarian, uh, an, an agrarian economy, one that, that's heavily based on farmers. And so this bill was meant to aid those struggling American farmers at this point. For years, for, for, for decades, farmers had been struggling in the West. And this, this gave rise to movements like the Greenback Party, like the populist movement with William Jennings Bryan, even with the Progressive Party. And so th this bill would have aided farmers in, in, in such a way that they would not have a surplus of crops left over in that the, the government would buy the extra crops that they weren't able to sell at a fixed rate in order to kind of bolster these, uh, the, these farms in the West. Now, the president feels that it's a violation of the free market. And so Coolidge, you know, is this, this very, much, very much a laissez-faire kind of guy. He, he doesn't think, he thinks that basically Free capitalism, capitalism in, in the most outright sense, should really be what the United States goes for. And so he thinks that the prices should be whatever the law of supply and demand account for, and that the government should have no purpose in, or should have no, no uh, involvement in buying these products from the farmers that they were actually only going to then sell to other people. He, he thought that, that that was really just a prop up and that the government had no business doing it. At the time, these vetoes are very popular due to the continued economic growth that the country was experiencing. But this plays a major role in the plight of American farmers throughout his entire administration and into and throughout the Great Depression. So largely because of Coolidge's laissez-faire policies, again, they're, they're popular, they're successful in the 20s, but when we get to the Great Depression that causes much of the suffering, of Americans throughout the country, and this was especially seen with farmers in the West. Now, named for the Secretary of State and the French Foreign Minister, the Kellogg Grand Pack of 1928 was an agreement that was eventually signed by a total of 62 countries, a great many uh, in the country. 
Now, this is one, this is the only uh, real, this is one of the few real instances of Coolidge breaking with the isolationist policy. Um, and again, it wasn't even really necessarily him in the beginning. It was his, it was his secretary of state, uh, Kellogg. Now, the agreement was that anyone who signed the Kellogg Brown Pact would not use war as a means of diplomacy. And again, in the wake of World War I, everybody was trying to avoid another world war. And the Kellogg Brown Pact was a way of, of, of attaining this ideal. So this is just naturally impossible to enforce, you know, like, it was an agreement that these two, the Secretary of State of the United States and the uh, French foreign minister come up with this crazy idea that, oh yeah, countries just shouldn't go to war anymore, you know? Like, we'll just have people talk out our differences. And and it's it, 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 naturally the only way to enforce that would, in fact, to be to go to war against another country, to, to enforce the idea that war should not be the means of diplomacy. And so, yeah, obviously it's a naturally impossible thing to enforce, but it serves as a symbolic agreement, uh, a, a symbolic agreement over the whole world, or over much of the world, that another world war should be avoided at all costs. And again, this was seen with things like the League of Nations and the Treaty of Versailles, and they all failed. But it, it, it was naturally monumental during the the time and and, and, and not, nothing like this had really ever happened before other than the league of nations so it was a a big stepping stone you know into current diplomacy today now coolidge unexpectedly announces that he won't run again in 1928 while vacationing in south dakota he naturally he uh characteristically famously remarks that i do not choose to run for president of the united states in 1928 and so his motivations for this are not initially very clear, but speculation can tell us, uh, and educated guesses can tell us that they were most likely influenced by Washington's president. You know, Washington's president was that the president should only serve two terms, you know. Uh, and, and many people said that, you know, Coolidge, he only had a, a two-year first term, less than that. So he, it wouldn't be two full terms, but in Coolidge's mind, it would be. It, 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 to the best of our knowledge, Coolidge, you know, would have thought that nobody would have ever had the amount of time he would have had in office had he run again ten whole years. And so this was probably his influence for not one of his influences for not running again in 1928. Uh, the other was his apparent readiness to leave public life. Um, he was a very quiet man. You know, at a dinner party once, he's famously noted for saying that, or he's, it's, there's a famous instance in which a reporter comes up to him and says, Mr. President, I can, I bet I can get you to say more than two words. And his response is, you lose. And, and this is a blaring, the, the greatest example of Coolidge's, you know, um, uh, quiet, very quiet mannerisms, very quiet demeanor, very calm demeanor. Uh, and so and actually this wasn't suited for the public life, you know, going into the 20th, going into the later into the 20th century as, as the presidency would be one of the most watched uh, per people in the country. And so he, he was very ready to leave in that sense. It's also influenced by the death of his son, Calvin Jr., unfortunately. And his son, it's a bizarre story, but his son was uh, playing with his brother, I believe, in the White House when he got a blister, um, and uh, and this this got infected. I believe the 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 belief now is that he had sepsis, and that he died about a week after that. And Coolidge always blamed himself for not better taking care of his son, better watching his son, and this this greatly plagued Coolidge's mental state throughout the rest of his administration. So by 1928, it seemed like the right time for Coolidge to leave office, although he would have naturally easily won had he run again. Now, after leaving office, Coolidge returns to Northampton, Massachusetts, uh, and here he writes his autobiography and works on several articles for several magazines, uh, which um, many of these uh, 
columns that he writes become very popular nationwide. Now, this, this, this lifestyle largely continues up until his death, which occurs on January 5th, 1923, or 1933, rather, from coronary thrombosis, which is a uh, type of heart failure. Now, Coolidge is later buried at Plymouth Notch Cemetery in his hometown in Vermont. Now, that's going to do it for our biography of Calvin Coolidge. Next time, we're going to focus on his successor, Herbert Hoover, so you can look forward to that. Thanks for watching.